Good evening. I'm David Cataforis, Professor and Chair of Art History at the University of Kansas. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Kansas resides on the ancestral territory of the Kaw people, who were forced off their land by the United States in the 19th century and largely relocated to Oklahoma. This acknowledgement recognizes Native Americans as traditional guardians of the land and the enduring relationship between Native peoples and these traditional territories. I'm pleased to welcome you to another lecture in our series, Intersections of Identity, Expression, Exchange, and Hybridity. The series asks, what constitutes identity? How do people navigate, form, and reform their sense of self? And how can the study of art and its history help us to consider the diverse identities expressed by visual culture and its creators? We seek to amplify the voices of scholars and artists whose work explores individual and collective identities as those intersect with notions of the body, disability, gender, heritage, and race. The series is organized by KU's Crest Foundation Department of Art History and the graduate students of the History of Art, Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Committee. It is sponsored by the Frank and Murphy Lecture Fund. We present it in partnership with the Spencer Museum of Art and KU Department of Visual Art. We are grateful to Art History Department Office Manager Lisa Clore for all of her organizational help. And we acknowledge the creator of the poster for this evening's lecture, KU student Cormac Palmer. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Laura Kina, who is Vincent DePaul Professor in the Art School at DePaul University. She is an artist scholar specializing in painting, contemporary art, and ethnic studies. Her artwork focuses on themes of distance, belonging, the fluidity of cultural difference, and the slipperiness of identity. Asian American studies, contemporary Asian American art, critical mixed race studies, and feminist queer theory form the nexus for her intersectional scholarly research. Professor Kina earned her BFA in painting and drawing from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and her MFA in studio art from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her artworks have been exhibited nationally and internationally at venues including the Chicago Cultural Center, India International Center, the Japanese American National Museum, Okinawa Prefectural Art Museum, Rose Art Museum, Smithsonian Archives of American Art, and the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience, among others. Her grants include awards from the Art Matters Foundation and Three Arts and a Joan Mitchell Fellowship. Her illustrated children's book, Okinawan Princess, The Legend of Hajichi Tattoos, written by Lee A. Tonucci, received the 2020 Skipping Stones Honor Award for Multicultural and International Books. She is co-editor of Queering Contemporary Asian American Art and of War Baby Love Child, Mixed Race Asian American Art, both published by the University of Washington Press. Professor Kina is a lead curator for the Virtual Asian American Art Museum, co-founder of the Critical Mixed Race Studies Conference and Association, co-founder of the Journal of Critical Mixed Race Studies, reviews editor for the journal Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures in the Americas, and editorial board member of Amerasia Journal. She also serves as a series editor for the University of Washington Press's Critical Ethnic Studies and Visual Culture book series. In 2020, she and Yasuko Takezawa co-edited a special edition of the journal Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures and the Americas on the theme of Trans-Pacific Japanese Diaspora Art, Encountering and Envisioning Minor Transnationalism. And most recently, Professor Kina worked with Chong Tan and Tina Chen to co-edit the Spring 2022 special edition of Verge, Studies in Global Asias, with the title, Visualizing Asias, Interventions in Asian and Asian Diasporic Art. Laura Kina's lecture this evening will be followed by a question and answer moderated by Vidita Raina, a member of our DEAI committee. So please type your questions for Professor Kina into the chat in YouTube, either during or immediately following her talk. I'm now happy to turn the screen over to her for her lecture, Interdependent Strategies of Friendship and Care in Asian American Art. 
All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor um, Kataforis, for introducing me. And I want to thank all of the graduate students who helped organize tonight. Um, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Vidita Reyna and Mary Francis, who met with me ahead of time to let me know some of the needs of the KU art history community um, and all of the planning that went into tonight. Um, Logan Ward, I guess you're going to be doing adding the closed captioning. So thank you so much for doing that. So hi. <laughs> my name is Laura Kina. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And for those of you who may not be able to see me, I have toasted sesame colored seed skin, short white hair, and oversized clear uh, framed glasses. I'm wearing a black shirt with little polka dots and turquoise laser cut earrings. And I'm sitting in front of one of my Unchinanchu paintings featuring a bold Okinawan Bengata floral design. I'm a mixed race Unchinanchu American artist scholar based in Chicago, um, the traditional homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy, Ojibwe, Adawa, Potawatomi, and also the Miami Anoka Ho-Chunk, Sac, Fox, and Menominee, and I am an uninvited guest on this land. Um, I offer my respect and gratitude to the many original peoples who still reside here. So often in the art world, we are taught to compete against each other and hold our cards really close. Um, and I also recognize for a lot of Black, Indigenous, people of color artists, we use Ebert Glissant's concept of the right to opacity as a means of protection for ourselves and our communities as a way to resist having our identities and work centralized. Um, however, tonight, I wanna pull back the curtain to share who some of the key people are in my network of Asian American art and to reflect on how we've built networks of care, collectivity and collaboration that have helped sustain me for the past 30 years of arts organizing in Asian American and Asian diasporic communities. Um, my intent here is not to have you sort of pressed up against the glass window looking in, but rather to invite you to be part of these networks, share resources, help write this history, and inspire you, you know, hopefully, <laughs> as you build your own diverse communities in the arts. So one moment here while I screen share. The most important and longest running Asian American network of independent, interdependent care that has helped sustain me is my family. <laughs> um, I have been blessed to be loved, cared for, supported and encouraged and accepted in a family despite our different political ideologies. I was born in Riverside, California in 1973 and I grew up in the Pacific Northwest on Coast Salish territory in a small Norwegian town called Palsbo, Washington. Uh, my dad is a retired family practitioner who took care of folks in our rural community from cradle to grave, and he served as an elder in our church. My mom um, was, a prime, was like the primary sort of gravitational force in our family, she probably still is, <laughs> um, that we all revolved around. And she had her hands full, raising four children, taking care of her mother-in-law, helping with her family's motel, and volunteering as an elementary school art teacher, Sunday school teacher, missions director, and giving us kids lots of lists of chores. We were raised in a non-denominational evangelical church in the woods with sort of hippie Lutheran roots in a Navy community. So think Bible study, potlucks, like food co-ops meets Costco, and then tambourines and acoustic guitars summoning regular appearances of the Holy Ghost. So I love this bad family portrait of us from 1988 because of my ridiculous haircut, my little brother's Mork and Mitty Rainbow suspenders, and my sister Allison's uh, McDonald's kid sweatshirt. Allison had Down syndrome, and we were fortunate enough to have her in our lives um, and fill our lives with laughter and alternate ways of experiencing the world for 12 and a half years. Um, this is one of the last photos of us together before she died of congenital heart, heart failure. Can I turn the slide? <laughs> okay. 
Um, my grandma Kina came to live with, with us when I was six. And as you can see from the circa 1981 photo, those Robin Williams suspenders were originally mine. Uh, my grandma Kina was wired a bit different and she was never able to hold a job. She was my playmate and muse as much as she was my grandma. And between her and my sister, I learned the value of life and time outside, the, outside of the binds of the capitalist ideas of one's worth being valued in terms of your labor or effective use of time. And we wasted our time beautifully together, wandering in the woods, watching TV, listening to music and singing and making messes. So I'm only three slides in and I'm already going down um, a suspender rainbow tangent. <laughs> the point of these first day of school images is that I felt racially different than my classmates. I was a little weird, nerdy, theater arts kid. I did experience overt racism and microaggressions. I felt like both an insider and an outsider in my own community. And it wasn't until many years later that I began to understand sort of my own race and class privilege and how segregated my life was from other black indigenous people of color and to start to learn what it means to be Okinawan and how I could use my privilege to open doors for others. So my dad's side of the family is Okinawan from Hawaii. Uh, they immigrated in the early 1900s as sugarcane plantation workers on the Big Island. And my mom's mother was Spanish Basque. She was a seamstress from Vallejo, California. And her father was Euro-American Navy man from Waco, Texas. My maternal grandparents lived near us and they had a string of small family businesses over the years in Kingston, Washington, um, including a gas station, a drive-in restaurant, a roadside motel, many warehouse storage, and an early cable TV company. Um, and my great grandma lived with me, with them, um, and she was a seamstress and taught me how to sew. So at age three, I started out as an abstract painter before moving to representational imagery. Um, my mom had uh, double majored in art and sociology and she had wanted to be a printmaker. And I called her right before tonight's talk and I learned that she had, I don't know why I never to know this before. She studied with Glenn Alps at University of Washington in the fifth year that she did there. Um, and he's the one of the, uh, he had someone who's known for developing um, the Colograph. Um, she worked as a commercial artist doing sign painting and as an illustrator for Boeing. And she taught me how to draw, paint, use power tools. Love it that my mom taught me how to use power tools. Basically any DIY problem solving and she really encouraged me in the arts. So thank you, mom. Um, I moved to Chicago in 1991 to go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago where I got to study painting and drawing from Michiko Itatani and the late Ray Yoshida. Uh, Ray was from Kauai. Um, and Chicago images, Carl Worsom, Gladys Nelson, and so many other great professors. I love this angsty 90s photo of me in my studio at SAIC. Um, it is a bit unusual for an Asian American family to actively encourage their child to be an artist. <laughs> so I've asked my dad about this, um, and he said that if he was able to make it, the jump from being a sugarcane plantation field worker to being a doctor, he said that I knew he knew I could do this too. So this was back when we, some of us still believed in the American dream <laughs> and work hard, I did. The only catch was that the systems for what I thought were success in the art world and academia were not designed for women of color like me, but thankfully I had one early role model, Michiko Itatani. Um, so when I was her student in advanced painting, she told me about her own experiences working collectively with artists in alternative spaces, such as Name Gallery in the 1970s. And she encouraged me not to wait to be discovered, but rather to mobilize with other artists to make the world I want to live in. So with her marching orders in hand, I set out to learn ways how to carve out and queer spaces for Asian American art, both inside and outside of existing institutions. So I'm gonna go back to this slide, this uh, painting here by Michiko Tatani. Um, it's this kind of moment of extraterrestrial encounter. And I wanna think about interdependence, not as being codependent, but rather as a sustained encounter with a person or a group in which we choose to hold space for each other, be in dialogue, travel time together, 
and depend on each other. I would be remiss if I didn't include a major cliff note of my interdependence within my nuclear family in Chicago. Um, I got married at age 24 to a Jewish man, Mitchell Aronson, who's 14 years my senior. I converted to Judaism. I helped raise Mitch's daughter, Arielle, from when she was three years old on. Um, she's 27 now. <laughs> I got my MFA in 2001 at UIC at the stu in studio art, where I studied with renowned painters, Carrie James Marshall and Phyllis Bramson. At age 31, Mitch and I welcome Adori to our family. And at age 41, I became a full professor at DePaul University in Chicago. Now to the present moment. I've been writing this lecture in bits and pieces for the past few months in between being spooned out on the couch from exhaustion of going back to teaching full-time in person while I'm still trying to navigate the traumas of the aftermath of breast cancer and grieving the ruins of a 24 year long marriage. So having the securities of my body and primary relationship deteriorate caused me to have to reach out to other friends and family to help me see that I can do it all on my own. The extended time of lockdown isolation that so many of us experienced due to COVID-19 has only reinforced how essential friendship is. I write to you horizontally as a newly out queer, differently abled person who is still in the process of learning about what we're now labeling care work, all that invisible, unpaid, effective labor that I've been doing as a wife, as a mother, as an educator, mentor, board member, and so on, the care and cultural labor I've performed collectively with other artists, activists, and scholars for the past 30 years in Asian American communities, archiving, curating, storytelling, and building institutions to reflect that we were here, we exist. I write to you as a formerly very upright and tailor pantsuit wearing black leather boots type of femme who used to be in perpetual motion, running forward towards the next goal and rarely looking back. What, would I, what was I so afraid of would happen if I stopped? Would I be average, unqualified, invisible? forgotten, a failed model minority. From the time I landed a tenure track position as a diversity hire, at an art professor at DePaul in 2003, I did not stop. My labor was spurred on by the pace and pressures of capitalism and the politics of visibility with the neoliberal university extracting every ounce of me until I collapsed. So my insights and logic seem to want to grow sideways now. So please indulge me tonight um, through this mix of art and memory work. So this is a painting of mine that was featured on the wall in the previous slide. It's um, Hanoko Flight Path from my Holding On series. Um, and that series features sacred as well as World War II memorial and present day military occupied sites in Okinawa, Japan. And it explores memory and affect through the genre of landscape painting. Um, so what you see here is an aerial perspective, mixing influences of East Asian landscape painting with the converging perspectival lines of a future flight path of a much contested Hinoko um, US Marine Corps base that is being built in Okinawa. To geospatially orient you, Okinawa is the southernmost prefecture of Japan, and it used to be its own kingdom before being forcibly annexed by Japan in 1879 later occupied by the US from 1945 to 72, following World War II and the Battle of Okinawa, and then returned to Japan in 1973. And it is currently home to over 74% of the US bases in Japan, despite being less than 1% of the total land mass of Japan. And Okinawans have been vehemently protesting the unfair burden of these bases, but the US government, is continuing to dump tons of sand into Oro Bay, destroying the coral reef habitat of an endangered seed mammal called the dugong to build the Hinoko base. Being an artist requires a bit of creative greediness of all of the senses, an impulse to thrive while you survive, to accumulate, distill, comment, connect, break, and transform, 
it can require an outsized ego that insists on taking up space, much like this 2019 painting of mine of a giant banyan tree in Okinawa. In Ryukyu mythology, when God created the islands of Yayama, which are just southwest of Okinawa prefecture, they were covered with rocks. And so he called all the trees together to make the islands look better. And the banyan tree and the cow, uh, cow tree were the last two trees to appear. And upon seeing all the land taken up already, they hesitantly asked God, where should we go? And God was mad at these latecomers. And he said in a harsh voice, you go grab any rock you can find. And then God left. So today you can still see the Akao and Gajimaro banyan trees grabbing hold of the rocks with their roots as if it really was the last choice left for them. So this is a 400 year old banyan tree that is growing up through the roof of a collapsed limestone cave. There is a pile of um, uh, rocks at the bottom of the painting that indicate the site of an ancient grave. And I see this banyan tree as an ancestor embodying indigenous interdependent strategies for survival with its vast network of prop roots that venture out to find new sources of water and rocks to hold on to while working together to support larger, older branches. As I am belatedly coming out of my pandemic cave of isolation, I wanna use this lecture as an opportunity to stop, reflect, and share some of my past diversity, equity, and inclusion work in Asian American art to consider what strategies of friendship and care have helped sustain me and to think beyond extractive tendencies in DEI work to exploit the labor of the very people these policies are meant to support. So less than two years ago in June, 2020, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, I learned I had stage one breast cancer, which we were able to successfully treat through surgery. But I had an aggressive form of cancer with a very high reoccurrence rate. And I had to go through chemotherapy and radiation. And I'm currently on hormone therapy to prevent the cancer from coming back. I'm gonna read a poem I wrote on August 16th, 2020, as I was trying to make sense of the risk factors that may have contributed to me getting sick. I had been living my life in, at an unsustainable pace, burning the candle at both ends, not sleeping enough, internalizing my stress. And I was really more focused on taking care of everyone else around me than myself. So that just to show you what the picture is in the background there is this, this piece here, um, Mabuni in Itaman, um, uh, Okinawa. Risk factor, undifferentiated cells miscommunicate in a milky cloud of white rice white sugar, and white gaijin genes that beat out my Asian breast. Hawaiian plantation pesticides merge with California smog to birth me into Pacific Northwest nuclear Navy base. Shadows that shade my early puberty teenage grunge birth control pills and seventh grade punk cigarettes that drift into art school cool. Oxidized oil, hydrogenated hormones, Meat, Midwest red meat, barbecue, flame grilled, fried, free radical fat, estrogen dominant BMI, hair dye, heavy metal tinted lead histories painted with phthalocyanide blues, stained deoxazine purple and cadmium red, professional no chip nail futures dissolving into solvents, the cost of smiling in a model minority mask, a woman of color shoulders community wedging doors open while swallowing anger, racing race in an ivory tower to the top to be seen, to be heard, sweating aluminum antiperspirant, undercutting underwire push-up bra, blocking lymph node glands, circulating electromagnetic fields revolve in my microwave multitasking motherhood. Coffee fuels deadlines propelling projects that wind down with whiskey and wine. Sleep apnea, grinds, insomnia, leaving me wired but tired. Plastic estrogen angels of life and death watch over a cortisol spiked busy bee invested with too many laptop hours, punctuated by airport security scans and IVF as a complex web of hormones battles for balance. Like autumn leaves that refuse to give way to winter's naked branches, the cells in my right breast cling to each other in a, pack, in a pact to resist their programmed death. 
They hide in my denseness, undetected for a decade, slowly clawing at my tissue with octopus arms until a tumor springs through my ducts one COVID morning. Come summer, the tumor is surgically removed before I fall into a chemo routine. So if there is a silver lining in my illness, it was the outpouring of support I received from so many folks in my network and getting the opportunity to reconnect. So I see you all, and as your lives have touched mine, I've also changed. I wanna give you one example of a transformative moment with someone who, was a, who is a professional acquaintance. Um, last spring in 2021, I received a care package from a young Taiwanese scholar named Yi Ting Chan, Chang from Penn State. Um, Yi Ting and I met in 2019 at the American Studies Association Conference through a panel she organized titled Reimagining Trans-Pacific Sovereignty. Um, in which we explored decolonial aesthetics in Taiwanese and Okinawan diasporic art and sought to unsettle notions of independent personhood and nationist, nation states, sorry, in, notions of independent personhood and nation states beyond imperial paradigms of sovereign independence. So one key question that has stayed with me that she asked our panel was what might happen if we reject independence or liberalism as a framing principle of sovereignty and instead look towards inter and intradependence as an alternative feminist conception. So I've been slowly unpacking this question in conceptualizing what Okinawan indigenous self-determination might look like outside of the confines of US or Japanese occupation or the misplaced nostalgic desire to return to the independent Ryukyu kingdom times. And instead thinking about a more inclusive Shimanshu futurity, and more on that soon. <laughs> I'm writing a paper about Okinawan American uh, ceramicist Toshiko Takaezu for a retrospective exhibition of her work at the Noguchi Museum in New York. Um, so, in addition to some makeup, um, Yu Ting sent me this book, Care Work Dreaming Disability Justice by Leah Lakshmi um, Piepsna Samara Samarashina. And in that book, I stumbled across interdependence as one of the 10 principles of disability justice. So we have intersectionality, leadership of the most, those most impacted, anti-capitalist politic, cross-movement solidarity, recognizing wholeness, sustainability, commitment to cross-disability solidarity, interdependence, collective access, and collective liberation. So um, interdependence here is defined as before the massive colonial project of Western European expansion, we understood the nature of interdependence within our communities. We see the liberation of all living systems in the land as integral to the liberation of our own communities, as we all share one planet. We attempt to meet each other's needs as we build towards liberation without always reaching for state solutions that inevitably extend control further over our lives. So I read care work over the course of three days, locked in my bathroom, laying on the cool floor tiles. And you're seeing the view, <laughs> the picture of I took of my bathroom ceiling. It was a moment of complete exhaustion at the end of my active treatment for cancer. And it was a turning point in my life where I knew I could never go back to my old former self. I still really hard for me to articulate what or why things changed. But at the end of this book, I concluded that I was undoubtedly queer and that the future work I do in Asian American art needs to include disability justice, feminist concepts such as interdependence. Read that book. <laughs> I think you know it's probably gonna talk about things far better than I can, but. Um, so the strategies of friendship and care, this is what I promised I'd do in this lecture. It's really rather things I've learned from doing diversity works and arts often the hard way or the wrong way. <laughs> in um, movement building and DEI work, we each play a different role. And I should preface my comments by saying, I don't really think I'm actually a particularly good friend in a traditional sense. I forget birthdays. Sometimes I forget your name. I don't send care packages or letters. I don't mother folks <laughs> in ways you might associate with female care. Nor am I the social practice artist or community activist that is leading from the front. My strengths are, to use <laughs> the neoliberal Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point terms, that I'm a combination connector maiden. 
both a person who knows a lot of people and an information specialist. And I'm dependable, I'm currently employed. In other words, I have the capacity to open doors. So in no particular order, things I've learned, play and eat together before working together. Better yet, make the work play and don't discount pleasure and joy as a waste of time. Work collaboratively to build sustainable structures that will outlive your individual efforts. Question the foundations and territory on which you are building. Who was here before me? Whose territory are we on? Who is being served? Who is profiting from our efforts? How are we giving back? Is this the right home or form for this project? And ethics of care, sort of community accountability, right? And safety. Um, and then respect differences, positionalities, abilities, and capacities. And I want to give a hat tip here to APA Voices for that last point. Know when to step up and also when to step back. Ask for help, let others help, and then empower them to help. Create networks of care so that could be food, ride, check-ins, mentorship, and so on, or access care networks. Don't be afraid of being difficult or disagreements, as long as you're centering mutual respect. And that includes respect for the quality of the work and compensation. It's okay to walk away. Sometimes things don't work out, it's not the right timing, or they've lived their course. And then trust your gut, your body, your intuition, and dreams. Spooning out. It's okay to rest. It's okay to stop. It's okay to do nothing. And then access and inclusion, engagement. Who is missing? Who wasn't able to participate and why? How can we do this better? So I want to pass along some actual real resources. You can go to these sites, find things. This is from the APA Care, um, courtesy of activist and artist Tommy Arai in New York, apavoices.org backslash resources. And then um, if you go to YouTube, to the APA Institute, um, look for their on community care, documenting APA voices during COVID-19. Um, and the keywords for this here are solidarity, difference, care, and community. So when I was an undergrad at SAIC, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, I joined my first Pan-Asian American Arts Organization. And at that time, uh, we used the acronym APIA, Asian Pacific Islander American. So founded in 1992 in Chicago by Maureen Liping Mark, um, who was then a graphic designer, we officially defined Destination as a Pan-Asian American Arts and or an education association. The group was first launched with a city of Chicago funded um, uh, curated group exhibition at North Lakeside Cultural Center in 1992. And that show traveled to the South Shore Cultural Center culminating at the Chicago Cultural Center downtown. Um, and the first group show was done by an open call. And our group consisted of a lot of young artists, myself included, and who were contemporary artists from mostly from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Um, as well as commercial art, commercial photographers and immigrant artists who were established in their home countries, but maybe virtually unknown in Chicago. And I remember there being a, uh, several artists who worked in craft traditions like Japanese pottery or Jakarta paper cutting. Um, and the group consisted of Filipino, Thai, Korean, Vietnamese, Japanese, and Chinese artists. There was a diversity in age medium, training, geographic origin, and ethnicity that was really notable. And it was both our strength and our weakness. So from um, that early 1992 roster here, I've stayed in touch with many of the artists over the years, including my friends, Cesar Conde, uh, Eulalio da Silva, and Larry Lee. So our group formed at the height of the institutionalization of multiculturalism. Um, and in direct response to Saegu, or the April 29th, 1992 Los Angeles uprising that exploded following the Rodney King trial verdict. Um, the, group, the goals of the group were to gain recognition for and increase educational resources on artists of Asian ancestry working in Chicago, and also to build multicultural alliances, particularly between Black and Asian communities. And in Chicago at the same time, Destination emerged, the Asian American Institute, uh, acronym was AAI, was also founded. It's since been renamed the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago. And many of the same battles over discrimination and lack of representation that they had set out to solve, Destination also hoped to address through the visual arts. 
And during the three years of this group, besides a traveling inaugural group show, we curated thematic exhibitions, presented at conferences and schools, and the group became a nonprofit early on. But public arts funding was increasingly hard to find in 1995, and we were unable to sustain the level of energy and finances needed to continue um, officially collaborating and group relations were ultimately untenable through the 501c3 model. So I wanna remind you again about this idea of interdependence. Literally the moment we tried to reach out for state sponsorship, things fell apart. And we were not, we're not the only Asian American arts org in town though. There's Pintic Cultural Group was founded 30 years ago and they, put on, they still put on plays about the Filipino diaspora experience. Rickshaw founded by Alex Yu and Nicole Samita launched a magazine, curated shows and led writing workshops during the early 1990s. And then in 1995, the Foundation for Asian American Independent Media um, Film Showcase launched. So one of the things that has lasted for me from Destination is my friendship with artist, curator, educator, Larry Lee, who I consider my older brother um, and my go-to gallery hopping buddy. Larry's worked for decades in admissions as, and as an instructor at SEIC. And he's always introduced me to new Asian, Asian American um, MFA grads and faculty there. So um, I've made a constant new stream of friends in the arts through Larry. He's really an ultimate connector. And you can see him here cooking the books with the, our, his partner in crime, Jason Dunda, for their International Chefs of Mystery. Uh, International Chefs of Mystery. So to give you one example, through Larry, I met Aram Hansa Fuentes, and I painted her here after um, Yasuo Kuniyoshi. She's working on one of her protest banner lending library banners. Um, she has actually has a show up right now at the Skirbel Museum in uh, LA. Um, she's paint, she's uh, she's creating she's working on one of her protest banner lender lending library banners in response to well everything Trump. And then at this time period, specifically the 2018 Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearing. Art merges with life. So on March 3rd, 2017, my then 12 year old kid Midori and I checked out this too cute to be binary banner from Aram to take to the Trans March for Liberation in Chicago, which was organized by Trans Liberation Collective in response to Trump's anti-trans legislation violence against trans and gender non-conforming people, and to remember individuals from those communities who are murdered in the United States during those first three months of 2017, including Misha Caldwell, Jamie Lee Wounded Arrow, Jojo Stryker, Jacarius Holland, Kiki Collier, China Doll Dupree, Sierra McElving, and Sean Hake. This photo is actually a portrait of five artists. So you have me and Midori, and then Aram's banner. The too cute to be binary quote is from intersex activist Pigeon Pagonis. And then the photo was taken by Sarah G of Love and Struggle, a grassroots social movement documentary photographer in Chicago. After graduating with my MFA from UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and as I was beginning my teaching career, I got involved with another Asian American arts organization. This is the Asian American Artists Collective Chicago, which ran from um, 2001 to 2005. So we were founded on August 21st, 2001 by Asian Pacific Islander American artists from the Chicago land area. Um, the Asian American Artists Collective, our, we, this was our mission, is committed to creating intersections between art, audience and activism. Um, it's a collab it was a collaborative network of diverse Asian American voices dedicated to artistic development, support, empowerment through the arts um, to confront, subvert, disrupt stereotypes, discrimination, prejudice, and oppression from outside and inside of our communities. So this Chicago-based group was active from 2001 to 2005. Um, AAAC, which in practice referred to in shorthand as the collective. Sometimes some members called it ACK, but usually it was the collective. <laughs> um, it was an informal collective of APIA artists that consisted of up to over a hundred artists, writers, in, uh, film, performance, spoken word, slam poets, short, short story writers, comedians, visual artists, sound artists, and curators. Um, and we all met on a regular basis in Chicago. 
The collective was founded by Anadiyu Ali and Marlon Escara, um, who borrowed the name of the or from the organization they led while dur um, during their undergraduate college years in from 1992 to 1996. Anita and Marlon were then uh, husband and wife collaborators. They founded the group in part because of their positive experiences in the early 1990s with collectivist action. And this included their undergrad literary magazine, Monsoon, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, published by the Asian American Artists Collective. And then also their late 1990s and early 2000s spoken word tour with Emily Chang, Dennis Denizen Kane, Kim in the group I Was Born With Two Tongues, which they described as a pan-Asian American spoken word quartet. Um, and you can see their album Broken Speak on Asian Improv Records from 2003. So Anita and Marlon were, all, were influenced by the Seattle Collective of on our, the collective consisted of the following groups. We had uh, subgroups, Mango Tribe, which was a touring feminist performance group, Kitchen Poems, that was like a writing circle inspired by workshops. And that was formerly run by author M. Evelina Galang. Yop, <laughs> Young Asians with Power, the Youth Writing and Mentorship Program. And then Project A, our visual art group, um, curatorial collective work and smaller collaborations. And so for all four of these subgroups, we would meet um, in a giant collective meeting at the former graphic design loft, which I showed you over here, of Anidia Ali, and it was called Atomic Kitchen and Anna Kong. And I think Adriel Lewis, who's now a curator for the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, uh, was a yacht member back in the day. So collectively, we put together annual interdisciplinary shows at the Foundation for Asian American Independent Media, uh, April Asian American Showcase at the Gene Siskel Film Center. Um, the acronym for that is FAME, <laughs> and uh, they were also our fiscal sponsor. We partnered with other groups such as SAPAC, which stood for South Asian Progressive Action Coalition. And I also recall that we did a few one-off showcases as, at big venues. And, um, and then we hosted uh, the second ever national APIA Spoken Word and Poetry Summit, which was hosted um, all over the city of Chicago, including on the campus of DePaul. And so each of these subgroups had a really long list of programming. In the group that I was part of, Project A, we spent most of our time, honestly, just so socializing <laughs> over Asian food. Um, but in between drinks, we did studio visits and curated a few shows, including Mythical Nation, uh, which was in New Haven. Um, and that brought our work in conversation with Godzuki and uh, members. And they are a group that formed after the Asian American artists group Godzilla and Basement Workshop in New York. Um, we did a show at Gallery 312 called 100 Cuts, and that included, included artists that would go on to make a real significant impact in the larger art world, such as Amanda Ross Ho, Emily Jasir, and Wang Wei. So one of the many reasons we felt we needed to collectivize across Asian ethnic lines was in reaction to the 2001 anti-Muslim climate that followed 9-11. And with our members heightened awareness of anti-Asian violence, the collective created info packets titled Remembering Vincent Chin or Regarding 9-11 that were distributed locally and nationally. So the, eclect, uh, the collective arose from a time that demanded a need for community and collective action, probably much like the time we're in now. And according to Anita Yuali, when I asked her about this in 2012, she reflected that the collective's ultimate demise, although not the only factor, came in its attempt to institutionalize itself with an official board and 5013C status. So do you notice a pattern here? That makes two APIA arts orgs dead on arrival as soon as they reach for nonprofit status. Um, so the group was officially dormant and we let the site go dark in 2011, but the collective partnerships live on and, I, and they have morphed into splinter projects and smaller collaborations. And so one of the things I've really valued the most from my time with the collective, of course, is all the friends that I can still count on. Uh, Larry and Anita, who I've mentioned before, but Robert, also Robert Karimi, Chen Yuan, and as well as Rickshaws, Nicole Samita, and Alex Yu. Collect collective member and Mango Tribe member, Ann Pucherian, um, took time to help me during the beginning of my cancer journey, even as she was near the end of her own battle with cancer. We lost her this past year. 
From 2009 to 2019, I worked with students at DePaul to conduct interviews with artists and arts organization from Destination, The Collective, Fame, and more broadly across Chicago in the Midwest. Um, and you can read over 150 interviews and view the related image galleries to DePaul's library here. Margo Machida and Alexander Chang. Okay, so Margo is a preeminent scholar in Asian American art, and I am fortunate to be able to count her as one of my close friends and in my informal mentor. She's pictured here in 2012 um, with another one of my longtime partners in crime curator scholar Alexander Chang, who's now at Rutgers. Um, these two women have sucked me into their vortex of projects for the past decade. And they've introduced me to countless Asian diasporic artists and scholars, including Jayshree Abhinchandani, Viet Le, Yang Soon Min, Tomi Arai, Albert Chong, Alice Mingwei Jim, Alpish Kantalil Patel, Midori Yoshimoto, Mark Dean Johnson, Suzette Min, and the late Karen Higa, and so many others. And I want to share with you some of the projects that grew out of the NEH Summer Institute they organized titled Re-envisioning American Art History, Asian American Art Research and Teaching. I think that these projects have been relatively sustainable because they have at least one anchor in a stable existing institution. They each have focused missions and they function within a limited time frame or specific sort of product or project rather be, than being amorphous and all consuming, which I, in my experience has led to extreme burnout. Um, but we still have ongoing issues in funding and staffing. So this is the Diasporic Asian Arts Network. Um, we are a, a college art association affiliated society and we organize panels, events, networking at CAA and beyond. And it's a network of, we call it DAN, is a network of scholars, artists, curators, arts writers, and graduate students interested in Asian American arts and Asian diasporic art and art history. And so visit our website. We're actually trying to organize panels right now for College Art Association. So uh, let me know if you have ideas. <laughs> um, Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures in the Americas Journal is published by Brill in conjunction with Concordia and New York University. So our co-editors and um, chief Alexander Chang and Alice Ming Wei Jim, they've kept us busy for the past five years in which time I've had the pleasure of serving alongside the amazing artist scholar Viet Le as a reviews editor. Um, and as David mentioned in the introduction, um, Yasuko Takazawa um, and I, uh, she's a Japanese cultural anthropologist from Kyoto University. We co-edited a, a special issue in 2020 on trans-Pacific minor visions and Japanese diasporic art. Virtual Asian American Art Museum. This is a multi-institutional large-scale digital humanities project. Please visit it. Um, I work as a volunteer curator for them. Um, Alexander Chang is the PI. She's everywhere. <laughs> um, it's a scalable project, so visit the exhibitions that we've launched so far. And I'm currently working with DePaul students to create spotlight modules for contemporary artists Jennifer Wolford, Jay Sri Abhinchandani, Robert Karimi, and Erin O'Brien. And we have some other ones that are live there you can check out. So Camilla Fohas and Wayming Dariotis. Um, Camilla is a former DePaul colleague of mine from Latin American Latino Studies and Wayming Dariotis and I met through our mutual work in what we called at the time HAPA Issues. And the three of us share a common connection through the Association for Asian American Studies. We all began collaborating in 2008 at a mixed leadership retreat, which were pictured here. And then Wei Ming introduced me to a bunch of Bay Area artists, including another major connector, filmmaker Valerie So, and the folks in AWA, the Asian American uh, Women Artists Association. Um, Wei Ming and I co-edited an anthology, War Baby Love Child Mixed Race Asian, Asian American Art, um, which featured contemporary artwork and, and interviews with artists, and that they were paired with uh, scholarly thematic contributions. And then we also curated, um, co-curated an NEA funded exhibition of the same title that started out at the DePaul Art Museum and then traveled to the Wing Luke Museum of Asian Pacific American Experience in Seattle. Um, then Camilla Wei Ming and I co-founded and co-organized, that's though this is us in the opening. Um, 
we co-founded and co-organized the Critical Mixed Race Studies Conference, as well as uh, the CMRS, CMRS Journal with G. Reginald Daniel and the Association. We partnered with Vanchen Cox and Chandra Crudup from Mixed Root Stories to organize um, a festival within each conference. So film screenings, performance showcase, music, et cetera, as well as arts panels. Um, and then Camilla and I also worked at, with DePaul faculty um, to establish the Global Asian Studies minor in 2005. It uh, initially was Asian American Studies and a crit Critical Ethnic Studies MA program in 2015. So Margo and Alex's influences keep going. So I met Jan Christian Bernabe through them in 2012. Um, and in 2017, Jan and I worked together to co-edit um, Queering Contemporary Asian American Art. Um, and Jan then introduced me to a whole new world of Philippinex diaspora cultural producers. And Jan now owns and runs an amazing gallery in Chicago called Fluxus Contemporary that's known for showing queer and bi POC artists. So the latest, uh, well, this is, this is some of the artists that were in the book and scholars. You can see here, Q Lee, or there's Jan, then Q Lee, Grayson Hong, Sarah Wolfolk, and Zave Marta Hajano. More happy people, <laughs> amazing artists, Alejandro Asierdo, Maria McCrindelal, Erin O'Brien, and Zave Martajano. So the latest evolution of my work with critical ethnic studies and critical mixed race studies is this book series for University of Washington Press on critical ethnic studies and visual culture. So we have um, incredible advisory board members, Aiko Day, Sarita C, Gisela Latour, and Amy Lone Tree. I'm gonna share with you as I'm closing here, a, a few studio collaborations. From 2009 to 2014, I collaborated with New Delhi based visual artist and fashion, fashion designer and poet and independent curator, Shelley Gioti on a traveling exhibition called Indigo, employing fair trade artisans from women's collectives in India and executing our work in Indigo Blue. Our works drew upon India's history, narratives of immigration, transnational economic interchanges, um, we met through Chicago's Women Made Gallery when Sherry was, Shelley was doing a residency in Chicago. And the person who brought us together was our mutual friend, Shelley Bahal, a former board member of the South Asian Women's Creative Collective in New York, who I met through the College Art Association. So our two woman show was self-organized and we toured it across India and Baroda, New Delhi and Mumbai, and then in the United States in Miami, Chicago, Seattle, and in Maryland. And Shelly and I learned, we learned a lot from each other you know, through this transnational collaboration. We both had to adjust, compromise, be flexible to different cultural contexts. And this was also my very first time working in textile and entering the world of craft. And we became really close through this project and our entire families became friends. Shelly's daughter Priyam uh, traveled with us to many of our shows and then sometimes was even a stand-in for her mom for US openings when her mom wasn't able to attend. So this, this is Shelley's work. Uh, Shelley Giotti's Indigo Narratives refer to India's history of 19th century indigo farmers, their oppression in um, Deltic region of Mahatma Gandhi's subsequent nonviolent resistance that began India's freedom struggle, the Champaran movement from 1917 to 18. And the works utilize indigo resist dyeing and printing on Khadi fabric with ninth and 10th generation Ajra craftsmen of Gujarat and uh, traditional embroidery by rural woman in um, Buj, which is in Gujarat, with the support of Shrujan Threads of Life. So um, my work, Devon Avenue Sampler, is a portrait of my diasporic South Asian Jewish Chicago neighborhood of West Rogers Park. And, and some of the works it features a bricolage of pop street signs rendered in patchwork quilt painting, as well as works that were hand embroidered by artisans from Marketplace Handwork of India, which is a fair trade women's organization in Mumbai. And I was connected to Marketplace by another woman made gallery artist, Indira Fridas Johnson. So um, this patchwork quilt paintings, this one here was inspired by the form of a Japanese borrow, borrow quilt. 
Shelley and I just had a reunion collaboration for a group show this past fall, Reimagining the Global Village, which was curated by artist, curator, ed educator, Nirmal Raja at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. So in 2015, photographer Emily Hanako Momohara and I had a two woman show at the Japanese American National Museum called Sugar Islands, Finding Okinawa in Hawaii. Um, it was curated by Crystal Hauser. The then president and CEO of Janum stated that in the 32 years of the uh, history of Janum, Sugar Islands is only the second Okinawan themed show. The first was in 2005 with Toshiko Takaezu's The Art of Clay. Sugar Islands is the first major US exhibit to explicitly encompass the themes of Okinawan identity through art. So there is a KU connection here. Um, as Emily and I were introduced to each other by Roger Shimamura. Roger was uh, Emily's mentor from 2003 to 2006 when she was working on her MFA. And Roger suggested Emily and I collaborate. And he also connected us with Crystal Hauser, uh, another multiracial Yonsei woman uh, who would go on to curate the show. Emily and I are both fourth generation mixed race Okinawan Americans. We share, share similar migration stories with paternal great grandparents being part of the plantation settler colonial immigration from Japan in Okinawa to Hawaii in the early 1900s. So Emily's, um, Emily's uh, family uh, relatives, they went to Kauai and they were to work uh, farming pineapple. And then my family was, you know, sugarcane plantation workers on the big island. We both grew up in predominantly white communities in the Pacific Northwest. And then as adults, we both became involved in Asian American arts activism. And among many other things, Emily served on the board of the Friends of Minidoka, and I served on the board of the Japanese American Service Committee. We both live and work as art professors in the Midwest. So our biographic similarities are uncanny and they extend to the origins of this project. So drawn by myths of ghosts of the past and inspired by pilgrimages to Hawaii and Okinawa in search of family history, Sugar Islands features complementary bodies of work, which share an otherworldly narrative cinematic quality as they explore themes of distance and belonging, um, memory, fantasy, and cultural reclamation. And in this model of collaboration that I had established working with Shelley Giotti, Emily and I worked alongside each other in routine dialogue, but each making our own bodies of work. And whereas Shelley and I approached venues directly with our proposal, this time we sought out um, an independent curator to work with, Emily and I, to create and pitch the exhibition proposal, curate the show, and be the lead author for the catalog. Emily and I established trust in each other through initial studio visits. Um, I had done an NEA, the NEA Summer Institute with Crystal, and then Emily had done a Smithsonian residency with Crystal. So there was like a foundation of trust and mutual respect. So one of my signature works for this show is my portrait Issei, um, which is currently actually on view over 65 billboards across Chicago as part of um, Chicago's Expo Chicago override billboard project. Um, it is a double ancestral portrait. So the central figure is a memorial portrait of my paternal great grandmother, Makato Mahira, who died in World War II in 1945 during the Battle of Okinawa. Um, the title refers to the Japanese language term for the first generation to immigrate, Issei. My great grandma Makato Gibu was Issei and immigrated through the picture bride system of arranged marriage from Okinawa in 1919 to work as a sugarcane plantation worker on the Big Island. So Emily and I both recently had our artworks featured together again in a group show called Ryukyu Turnover from Model to Artist, which was curated by Megumi Tomiyama at the Okinawa Perfectional Museum and Art Museum. And then wonderfully, the museum collected both of our works for their permanent collection. So it felt like a homecoming. Um, I'm just gonna briefly show you the works of mine that were on display at the Okinawa Perfectional Art Museum. Um, these are from my Blue Hawaii and Unchinanshu series. So you won't find Elvis or surfboards or funny umbrella top cocktails in my dystopic blue Hawaii, drawn from family albums, oral history, and community archives. These ghostly oil paintings employ distilled memories to investigate themes of distance, longing, and belonging. 
In 2015, I did another series exploring my Okinawan roots, but at this time I included actual artifacts from members of my Okinawan diaspora community. So in this one here, there's a t-shirt that's included from Denise Uihara, another amazing artist. And then in this one, Orion, um, there's things from the 2011 Unchinanchu um, Taikai shirt that were worn by delegates from the LA Kenjinkai. Um, Ryan Yakota donated these. In 2013, Okinawan American author Lee A. T. I come across my paintings of Hajiji in this series, um, which are pictured here at the bottom, right? Um, and he invited me to illustrate a story that he had written um, in Pigeon English. Panuchi has been leading efforts to destigmatize Pigeon, which is technically Hawaii, called Hawaii Creole for over two decades. And he writes exclusively in Pidgin and is known as the Pidgin Gorilla. Um, so although Lee and I share similar family stories, we did not have a, uh, ha have a history of friendship to begin with. But over the long course it took um, to research, fund, execute, and publish this book, we did become friends. I visited Lee in person in Hawaii and had him, his auntie his, and his niece pose for many of the um, scenes in the book. I knew nothing about children's literature going into this project, um, nor had I ever illustrated anything before. So I had to really learn to slow down on this project and to be a much better listener and to respect the process. I also had to let go of being bound by time and artificial deadlines. Lee and I invited Dr. Masashi Sakihara, who's a linguist of Ryukyu and languages from Okinawa to translate the book into Japanese and Uchinaguchi. And uh, Uchi Noguchi is, a spoken, is spoken on the main island of Okinawa, and it's one of six severely endangered Ryukyuan languages, or Shima Kutuba, island speech. And Dr. Sakihara spent time studying at the University of Hawaii and was inspired by Native Hawaiian uh, sovereignty movements, language revitalization efforts. And for this project, I crowdfunded through 3Arts 3AP project, and this really helped us build a community as we created the book. Gonna just play a clip here of the, what it sounds like. Remember, your babang and her tattoos used to think the marks on top of her hands was bruises. I thought great grandma was in some kind of Okinawan fight club or something. I was scared for hold hands with her when you babang come Hawaii in 1900. Shame she was. Cause over here, nobody get that kind of tattoo. That's why in every family picture we get, she's sitting down with her palms face up. See, but in Okinawa before time, all the women used to put from the design, you can tell what village they from, if they from the rich family, all kind mini get. But then later on when Japan make boss, they tell no nice put that kind. Pretty soon, even in Okinawa, people think no nice was. Now I think so all the old Okinawan ladies who had that kind, they gone already. So this is a trilingual feminist fairy tale set in contemporary and territorial era Hawaii and Ryukyu Kingdom uh, era Okinawa to illuminate an indigenous Okinawan tattoo tradition that pushes, Remember. Lingo, that pushes back against white and Japanese normative standards of beauty. The book draws on both Lee and uh, my family history as um, Canefield Okinawan my, cane, sugarcane migrant labors to Hawaii to tell a story that reframes Okinawan history and language as indigenous thus resisting Japan's colonizing imperial narrative to of claiming the Ryukyu Islands and people as part of Japan and merely ethnic minorities or, of Japan who speak a dialect of Japanese. So Okinawan women used to give each other these hand poke tattoos by rubbing a mixture of awamori liquor with sume ink or indigo dye. And on the main, on main island of Okinawa, a typical design of the Southern Haiburu region of Okinawa, for example, included arrows called ya running down each finger with a bow or yumi at each knuckle. Um, a marobushi or a round star graced the back of her hand and a five star design called ichichibushi um, covered her right wrist and another round star covered her left wrist. So women started to get um, the first part of the designs around age 17 to 23 before they got married. And then the design was enlarged at age 37 and more designs were added when grandchildren were born. And the tattoos functioned as adornment, a protection to mark out which Shima or island a woman was from. And they were also her passport in the afterlife. 
Okay, so last thing before I close, final project. <laughs> uh, painter sculptor Jade Yoshimoto, who is a, a professor of fine art and media at University of Nebraska Omaha. We started working together after our 2019 Joan Mitchell um, Foundation residency in New Orleans. And we discovered we have a mutual love for food. Here is Jabe about to eat an alligator pie at Jackie Mo's. So I'm gonna close here with a sneak peek at my, our pandemic project. It's an illustrated cookbook titled Word of Mouth, Asian American Artists Sharing Recipes. Um, eating together with other artists has always been a key component, even maybe a prerequisite for working successfully working together. Um, this project was conceived during the twin pressures of the spring 2020 you know, COVID-19 lockdown and in response to the rise in anti-Asian bigotry. So Jave and I invited 21 other artists. Oh, I should mention here, first on the cover, we have an illustration on the bottom is mine. That's a picture of Kim Marcelo Junio's um, vegan kare kare recipe ingredients. And in the back is an illustration uh, by Jave of Erin O'Brien's recipe, pork my buns XXX. Okay, so we invited 21 other artists from across the country to contribute a recipe and a backstory. And then we are also featuring their artwork. Um, we're gonna publish this on the Virtual Asian American Art Museum. So uh, it should be there in a couple of weeks. Um, so just you know, look for, go to that site and look for it. Um, this project was a total pet project. We had no real deadlines. It was true to pandemic form. The project meandered, it stopped and started. Artists dropped in and out. We couldn't land a publisher. There were a lot of blips and as both Jave and I both experienced health emergencies and personal traumas. And as our separate worlds started to fall apart, this project kept simmering along and it really provided us with a sense of community, solace, um, joy, and it's giving me a chance to really dig in to learn about how to use alt text in arts writing. And I would just love to plug Three Arts. They have great resources on accessibility in the arts. So if you go to threearts.org backslash resources backslash accessibility, um, you can get instructions on how to do closed captioning, alt text, and so, on, so many more things, accessibility in the arts. Um, so there's a lot of Asian food, of course, but then there are contributions like Robert Karimi's spinach casserole recipe from his Guatemalan mom. Um, she gave this to him when he was an undergraduate at UCLA. He had to go to a Christmas party where you had to cook your own dish and he's a great chef now, but at that time he had never cooked before. So his mom suggested this easy recipe because she said, quote, gringos love it, so they will love you. <laughs> um, I shared my recipe for Spam Musubi. Jave shared his recipe for Omega Mapo Tofu. And the book also includes recipes for political action, like the story of Christina Wong and the anti-sewing squad coming together through a model of mutual aid to sew masks for essential workers in vulnerable communities during the early phases of, of the pandemic. So I started this talk with this photo of me laying down. It was taken by my 16 year old uh, kid, Midori. Um, and it features an image of me totally zonked out after a major crisis, health, uh, health crisis mishap. But I also want to end with showing you what was outside of the first picture frame. My close circle of friends, my care web. Helen McElroy, Mark Worley, young son, Sonny Choi. Sonny is also my studio assistant and way in the back leaning against that tree from the very beginning, Larry. <laughs> so, and beyond this picture frame, there are so many other friends, families and colleagues whose lives are wonderfully entangled and interdependent with mine. So I see you and thank you. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kina, for such an uplifting and really a vulnerable lecture. Um, thank you also for sharing, you know, all the rich and diverse work that you have done over the years um, and for sharing with us this beautiful interdependent community that um, you've not only formed, but have also so sincerely um, served. 
Um, I think your lecture really informed us um, that the, this community and art, you know, they're not separate at all. Rather, they're the people and art are very much interlocked, um, interdependent too, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, we have a couple of questions and I, I have plenty of questions okay. too. So, um, so we have a question from Sarah Stepp from the audience. Um, who says, thank you so much for this incredibly generous talk. Are there any particular activities, ideas, or practices that you are providing, that are providing you with joy and inspiration right now? Oh, <laughs> I am a K-drama <laughs> addict, so <laughs> watch too much TV, but that's, that's not a healthy thing. <laughs> I've been, this is really silly, but like, I have to rehab my body. It's a mess. So I've been going to Zumba. I can't dance. It's ridiculous. But movement, walking, mm -hmm. <laughs> those are those are things that are making me laugh and making me feel better, trying to get balance in my life. Yeah. Um, but there's the question more about yeah. art things. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've been doing creative writing through my whole cancer journey. I you know, you, I wish I had an art, like visual art response to all this, but I, it ended up just tumbling out in writing. So that's mostly what I've been doing, writing. Laura, do you, do you anticipate making visual art out of this experience? You know what helps me? Deadlines. This is a key. So February, 2023 at the mm -hmm. Riverside Art Center I, in uh, Illinois, I will have a solo show. Don't know what it is yet. Don't know what I'm making, but I gotta make work. So actually this does help. So I have on my desk invitations of people asking me to be parts of shows. And if I say yes, then either I gotta show an old work or I gotta make new work. And after a little while, I don't like showing old work. So yes, I will be making work. <laughs> That's wonderful to hear. I, mean, I feel like deadlines help. But then, then the key for me is like saying no or just like pacing myself and not doing too much. I, I really have trouble with that. I like to say yes to everything. I think your lecture this evening showed that. I mean, so <laughs> many projects, so many collaborations, so many organizations. But at the outset, you talked about how you, unless I misunderstood how you're trying to maybe let let some of that go. I mean, are there well, things yeah, that you're letting yeah, go now? fine for the next generation for some things in leadership. And the best thing is when you can um, pass it along. Right. That's good. There's a phrase in Hawaii, if can, can. <laughs> so um, if no can, no can. So that's I have to actually practice. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Mary Frances, um, who asks, what, uh, thank you, Professor Kina, uh, what advice would you give to early career arts professionals about becoming a great supervisor or mentor it would be formally or informally, like Margot Machida for you, uh, when the time in their career comes. So what, what advice do I have for someone early in their career becoming a mentor? Yes. Um, so what advice would you have for an early, um, early career uh, professional? Um, I see. Since, yeah. Well, I think there's a couple of things that have worked. Um, I'm in academia. So in, in academia, in my department, uh, one of my good colleagues, Bibiana, a lot of all my colleagues are good, but my, my good friend Bibiana Suarez helped develop an official mentorship program within our unit. And so that there's guidelines and people are paired and there's ways that you, things you're actually supposed to accomplish. And then in my college, we have mentorship programs. So I think those are really nice to have those official things because it can be weird to ask for help. So there's that. I also am involved with professional associations and in each of those there's official mentorship and that those are really, really useful. Um, you know, if you can do residencies or these kind of things where you can build um, horizontal mentorship so it's not always someone above you. Um, but I realize those are very privileged spaces and places to be. Um, so I think it's, it's useful to find people to work together with and you work side by side and help each other rather than having sort of that asymmetrical relationship. You need a little mix of both. For me, it's really helped having mentors, not just in one place, because you can get 
such blinders to think that your issues you have in your little world, it's just so dramatic, right? But if you can find a network of mentors that's a little broader, it, it offers you perspective <laughs> to realize like, yeah, this happens over here too, or here's a solution. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of answer the question? Absolutely, yes. Um, and we have actually a couple of more, so I'm going to uh, ask a different one. We got the coffee with people back in the day when we could do that. We can't do that again again now, but those small things help. Uh, and in my college, there's a lot of sort of you know women of color that we mentor each other and are there for each other. It's, I would say, not always visible on purpose to the institution because it's for us. <laughs> Um, we have another question from uh, Logan Ward. Um, he actually has two questions, so I'll, I'll okay. ask the first one, uh, which is, could you talk about your creative writing and how it may or may not intersect with your visual art? Oh, I have no idea if it's any good or not. It may be like <laughs> super bad, but it didn't matter. Like there was, my brain felt broken. I couldn't read something. I couldn't write a sentence that made any sense, but I had so many observations and feelings and it, the form that things tumbled out was in poetry. Sometimes it was just three lines. Sometimes I would, you know, be thinking about it just, it, it was like a lifeline. And then as I was going through experiences, it helped to like, you know, that thing of dropping anchor for when you're in a traumatic situation, you describe five things you smell, five things you see, five things you hear, you use all your senses. I had to use mindfulness practices to get through things that were really not fun. And in the process of really paying attention to my whole body, you start to see the world around you in a different way. Um, so it, the next body of work that I'm gonna make, I'm gonna try to merge together all the photos that I was taking, things that I was writing with my painting. I don't know how that will manifest, but that's that's up next on my, uh, what's gonna, the magic in the studio that will happen. <laughs> um, but I've written, I, I collated it all together and it, it's it's over, almost a hundred pages of creative writing. And it, again, it could just be horrible. So some time needs to pass maybe a couple other sets of eyes need to be on things, or maybe it's like, you know what, Laura, that's just bad. Put that away, glad it helps you. I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, um, I actually had a follow-up question to that. And, you know, I'm thinking a lot about what you said, you know, about the spirit of isolation, which of course all of us went through. And now we're in this time of de-isolating almost, right? And trying to rebuild, um, some of these networks that kind of probably took a pause, I would say, uh, for a year or two. So do you find that there is a change in strategy maybe to these, uh, you know, care and friendship um, networks and relationships that you have been building over so many decades? And, and do you think that because of the pandemic and because of, you know, all of the isolation and now the shift again, um, there, there might be a slightly different perspective that you developed or perhaps not. I worry that we're gonna forget how to do all these access things that we somehow seem to be able to do. And as soon as we can go back in person, we forget. <laughs> so this is also for myself not to be so ableist, right? Um, I constantly need to think about that. Um, I'm new to learning about disability justice and there's a lot of work I need to do and learn how to do. So I need to be a student again, right? <laughs> so that's my hope. Um, and I, you know, it's a, something that's gonna take a while. So for right now, I'm just learning how to do alt text as poetry, right? <laughs> so that's my thing I wanna practice now or just being more attentive at events to make sure that you have access needs met um, or there's in a rush to go back to things in person, we are forgetting about even the, even the social aspects, people who are homebound and can't do that. Are there ways that they, we can continue to include people? Yeah, I just went back to work full time in January, so it's it's still a transition. The school I teach at, masks optional, just happened last week, so mm -hmm. it's all <laughs> it's a lot of transition and and uh, meeting accommodation needs 
we're all experiencing this in different ways. Some people seem to be just like back to normal and others are still really sick and grieving and, and yeah, I don't know. We're all sort of in different times and spaces right now. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll ask Logan's second question, which is, could you talk more about how seeking 501c3 status <laughs> contributed to the downfall of your organizations? So any of you that are part of nonprofits who are served on boards that you know you have to have a president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, you have to have right? Uh, bylaws and so on. And then you have to get funding. And then the funding you get, you need to be beholden to the grants. And before you know it, the creative energies you were putting towards making some weird thing, you're sitting there editing documents and it's, <laughs> you're mired in, in something. Now I can do that work. I'm happy to do that work. I'm, you know, doing those things behind the scenes a lot in my own uh, at my school. Um, but as artists, we might have different strengths and sometimes it's not those. It changes the dynamics. But really, if you think about it from a capitalist point of view, even though you're talking about nonprofit status, you're driven by who's funding it. So even the Virtual Asian American Art Museum, you will see right now a ton of Japanese American content. Why? Mm -hmm. We got a wonderful grant from the Terra Foundation and it needed to be art before 1980. Mm -hmm. um, I was the um, initial sort of lead curator for Chicago Midwest modules. And I decided rather than trying to do everything, I would do one focused thing. And I started concentrating on the Japanese American community in Chicago. And there's you know, a module on uh, Michiko Itatani, on Rei Yoshida, Miyako Ito, and so on. But you know, that's a lot of communities that aren't there, right? So it's following sort of a grant. And the idea is now other people need to come up and be part of this and it can sort of build out. But that's what I mean, like, grants are wonderful, but they tend to dictate the confines of where, how we're going to do our work, which doesn't always lead to innovation. Hmm. <laughs> it's a catch 22. I don't know. Um, well, we have uh, another question by Isabella, Isabella Huera, who says, thank you so much for this talk, Professor. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about um, your experience and development that led to your work as a curator? Mm, yeah, I don't even, well, so I still think of myself as just like an artist who does stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the first experience curating something was with Destination. So we were all artists participating in shows, but at the same time, we were learning how to build walls, how to do graphic design, how to market how to curate, how to edit things out, how to pack art, <laughs> literally all those skills, we did that. Um, I feel like it kind of go back to my childhood and growing up in the Pacific Northwest that was like grunge scene, DIY, everything. Um, I think there is sort of that ethos that comes from punk about DIY. Like don't wait for the perfect thing out there, just do it yourself. So that sort of model um, of alternative spaces and such, and that's also a super rich history in Chicago of alternative gallery spaces. Um, that's just sort of always been there. Yes, there's the gallery world, but they don't care about me. The museum world, I don't care about me. So you want to make stuff and you want to show, and how are you going to do that? Well, turn your garage into a gallery or turn your apartment into a one night show. And, and that's how it started, you know, um, and still. And I think there's still a lot of reasons why you want to show in an alternative space to do things that you're not having to have, you know, it's not beholden to the marketplace and you can explore ideas and have fun. Right. Thank you. Um, we have a question by Rachel Quest, um, who writes, uh, thank you for your insightful and profound lecture. Are there any strategies for developing an interdependent network that you would share with your past self? This is especially directed towards students. <laughs> um, well, I did buy into that sort of like, I need to get straight A's. I need to be the best. I need to do this myself. I don't need to ask for help. I just really felt embarrassed having to ask if I didn't know how to do something. <laughs> um, and so it's one thing about sort of external things you don't know how to do, but now going through sickness and 
it starts to get really embarrassing when you're like, I don't have the energy to do my laundry or I can't get off the couch. I need help. <laughs> like that's hard. That was so hard to be a very function, high functioning person and then be like, I'm not okay. I need someone to sit with me today. <laughs> right. Um, and then who's there for you? Yes. Sometimes we have our, our family and sometimes we don't, but is there ways where you can build friendships or networks where it's not charity, um, where you have a reciprocal relationship of caring for each other in different seasons of your life? Sometimes you're the one in need. Sometimes they are. Um, I don't really know. I, I Really, I feel like all the meaningful relationships I have had with people start over food (laughs) and listening and laughing um, with people. And then, I don't know, it's not really that complicated. I don't know if that's a good answer. (laughs) No, it is. It definitely is. But but I I have this book here. So so care work, right? Read this. They taught, you know. Um, Leah Lakshmi talks about um, care webs and gives you a lot of examples. I think I would point you to that resource for that because I am just learning this. I have not been one to want to ask for help, but I've learned so much. You know, I didn't really talk so much about all sort of, you know, the social unrest that we've gone through as a country and how that affected me. And I did try to go back to work way too soon, right after, while I was still in chemo and that, that didn't work out so well. But, um, you know, I was asked, uh, you know, to do media responses and sort of this rise, you know, rise of anti-Asian hate and, you know, respond, it, I was, at that time I was directing a graduate program on critical ethnic studies. And, you know, one thing after the next came in and I'm like, I don't have the capacity to do this. So I went to my, you know, the faculty in global Asian studies. And I'm like, let's work together to create a statement, to create a media response, to create resources. And now let's together go ask our community what they need. And then I feel like that model really helped where it's like, it's not all on me. It's not on my, all my shoulders. You are accountable to communities rooted in communities and you do it together. So you don't have to be the one only spokesperson. That's right. I asked Tommy a ride two days ago. Like, I don't know. I said, I'd write this talk. I have no idea. I got sort of panicking, like about care work. And she's like, let me tell you about APA voices. (laughs) So I'm like, go, you know, and that's, that's, you know, a whole community that's really worked together. So it's not one person. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe we may have just time for one more question, if that's okay. Um, we actually have a follow-up to Rachel's question about okay. <laughs> um, interdependent network building, but it's from Isabella, okay. um, and who asks, I would like to know if you have any, any, uh, any of these advices, especially for artists and professionals from other countries, since Isabella is from Brazil and would like to network more with Asian American art scene in different um in in, in I, I suppose in, in u.s there, there i would definitely point you to the diasporic asian arts network so although we are officially in a, a, a um a section of or caucus of college art association there's also a lot of things that happen outside of that where it's just like exchanging ideas um so i would say get involved in that it doesn't it's it's yeah it doesn't matter where you are in the world um so you can do that internationally um, and of course with technology, right? That doesn't, we, we can communicate, it doesn't stop us. Um, yeah, it's a really great, great activity. So you don't have to just go to the conference to be part of that. We do, or not me anymore, <laughs> other people organize events and, and things that are in person, but there also are things that are online as well. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing so much with us this evening. You know, your story, your your experiences, your lessons for us, your uh, things for us to ponder. And it was also a treat for us to see so many examples of your own artwork, which we're looking forward to seeing more of. We wish you the best in, in making new work for your upcoming shows. Yes, deadlines <laughs> are important for productivity. But it's also important to hear you talk about, you know, saying no occasionally and, you know, engaging in self-care and knowing when you need to stop and and take time for yourself and and get support from friends and family. 
I think we we all need to hear that, and 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 I think that that's something the pandemic has reinforced also is the importance of of family and support like that. So, everything you brought to us tonight uh, is very meaningful, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And uh, this uh, this talk will be archived on our YouTube channel, so people can can watch it again and 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 enjoy it. And we look forward to staying um, in contact with you, connected with you. And uh, for now, we're going to wish our audience good evening.